which will be September 9th um, out at Howard Woodfield. Uh, the two games this year at 3.30, we have Washington High versus O'Gorman. And then at 7 p.m., we will have Roosevelt versus uh, Lincoln High. And then our last event for the 2017 President's Bowl will be our basketball tournament, which will be held November 18th and the 19th. That's for grades fourth through eighth, boys and girls. Um, I think last year we had right around 61 teams show up for that basketball tournament. So it was very successful. Um, we do it at all three schools. And uh, like I say, once again, looking to improve and keep moving it on. So um, 2017 will uh, be a great year for President's Ball. Thank you. Good evening, board. Pleasure to be here tonight. Mark Miley, uh, coordinator of athletics, physical education. Um, I would like to second uh, that move on behalf of the President's Bowl on moving the uh, 5K to Saturday morning. Uh, I'm an avid runner. I didn't say a good one, but I'm an av avid runner. And I did participate in that, and uh, my time suffered a little bit. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, for me for the past 24 years that I've done this job as coordinator of athletics physical education to be a part of the uh, President's Bowl. And uh, I was going through kind of some of the minutes or some of the notes uh, today, getting prepared for this. And uh, in, um, I believe it was 1995, we had a good news report as well. I don't know if Deanne was here for that. I don't think she was. Uh, but the president uh, of the President's Bowl that night was Vern Freeze that year. And he came and we proudly uh, bragged about raising $12,000 <laughs> at each uh, school uh, for that joint effort. And uh, it's continued to grow uh, via the uh, efforts and services of uh, such dedicated parents. And uh, that's the, the neat thing about it. It's, it's kind of fun to go to games throughout the course of the year and see the parents sitting on other sides cheering for their respective teams. And uh, bless them for doing that. But uh, to come, and uh, put all of their uh, little blood, sweat, and tears together to try and raise money uh, for the number one common uh, goal and mission statement of the President's Bowl, and that's for the benefit of students. And that's uh, kudos to everybody, and uh, we've done it for 25 years. 26 will be next year, and hopefully uh, it will continue on. So um, just proud to be uh, a part of it, and it's, it's great to be here to have that good news or share that good news. So hope everybody has a good night. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for um, your time on the um, last year, and and good luck to you as well next year. But it couldn't be done without the support of um, our parents and our families and and staff. I'm sure too. So, thank you for um, dedicating yourself for the last year to do that, and for your upcoming year as well. Thank you. All right. Are there any? Conflicts of interest that need to be disclosed at this time. No conflicts that need to be disclosed. May I have an approval of the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <clears throat> Nine, supplement consent agenda A, claims to Samford Health Care. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That's moot is passed with one abstention from board member Ryder. We have a motion to approve supplement consent agenda 9B, claims to Avera. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion passes with an abstention by Board Member Parker. Dr. Maher, to you. All right, well, you might be thinking we're moving right along and this meeting's gonna be short. <laughs> you know, but let me tell you, we're about to slow it down just a little bit. We have, uh, we have an attendance report tonight that uh, Deb Muhlenberg-Wilson is going to bring us. And uh, before she starts, I just wanna say we, we've uh, previewed 
uh, this report and thought, gosh, it's really pretty lengthy. Should we cut it down? And the more I got to thinking about it, the more we thought, uh, not wise. This is fundamental to what we do in schools is to try to get kids to come to school. It's part and parcel of our strategic plan is to really work on the attendance. And we've got a lot of people who you're going to hear from um, tonight talk about a lot of different elements involved in trying to drive our attendance rates up. So um, I, I think this starts uh, probably at the national level, but certainly with uh, Governor Dugard kicking off the year and saying we want to improve attendance in our schools, um, having the momentum that we have in our own city, and then taking that up with our strategic plan where um, I, I think you're in, in for something very informative, if not entertaining. So with that, I'll turn it over to Deb. Well, that might be hard to live up to. <clears throat> I will tell you that the format for our presentation nights may be different than we typically would. Um, we'll have different presenters present different components um, of the plan. So by the end of the night, you will have seen me hopefully briefly. Um, Deanne Conrad will do part. I'm Celeste Uthi Bureau, Tracy Jensen, Molly Satter, and Mr. Nold, unless he skipped out, <laughs> which would be against the attendance policy. <laughs> so all of us believe and are committed to consistent school attendance. We know it has a positive correlation to school completion and academic success. Policy JH of the district says that and research supports it. Emerging from the strategic planning dialogues across our city in reviewing data, listening to stakeholders, and to having actionable dialogue came this goal to improve attendance. The goal that we've set is that by 2020, the number of K-8 students who do not attend school, at least 94% of the time, will decrease by 5%. What does that mean? In, in the 15-16 school year, there were 3,607 students who would have not achieved the goal that we've set as a district. <clears throat> so it's those 3,607 students that we want to impact their attendance as well as keep everyone else coming. So we know that the state's performance index has an accountability measure in K-8. We know that last June you revised our district attendance policy. And as a result of those changes, there's been dialogue at our building level on coding attendance, tracking attendance, and our information technology services department has worked on more accessible reports for attendance, which we know that over time all will need to improve, but at least we're on a track toward improving. At that point, um, the attendance committee began, and tonight's report is a reflection of their work, but the work of many in trying to tackle what's a really multifaceted problem um, across students. So we began with what might be our root causes of why a student doesn't attend. There was a lot of analysis of data, and I can tell you we've looked at it from all angles, and there isn't one clear pattern, one reason that interferes in a student's attendance. So I can tell you that there are patterns in the impact of poverty, of mental and physical health issues, and difficult family situations are all prevalent factors when you look at individual student needs. Consistent with national trends, our district um, sees higher rates of absenteeism in students who identify ethnically as black and Native American, but our students with disabilities also have a higher absenteeism rate. After analyzing data, the committee decided that to really improve attendance, we would need to focus on learning about, uh, learning about and problem solving around individual circumstances. 
that our systems were gonna have to think about those individuals situations and we were gonna have to design interventions to personalize to those students. It won't be a one size activity fits all. So with that becomes the topic of how do you raise everyone's awareness? I think that's turning on. Raising awareness, of course, uh, was one of the first steps, and I believe it was in June when we had our end of the year administrative meeting when we all read um, an article about a school district that was taking attendance very seriously and, and really digging in deep. And it was at that time, it's, the discussion was, what's the one thing every single one of us can do? And the one thing um, was encourage better attendance. And with that, I came back to the office just sort of fired up, ready to go, um, wanting to do my part in attendance as well. So the Office of Community Relations launched into a multifaceted awareness campaign, and we decided to go with the national campaign slogan, which was the same thing, attendance matters every student every day. We wanted to echo what would be um, mentioned on the national scale, and then South Dakota, just a few months later, D Governor Dugard uh, embraced that as a state. So we knew we were on the right path with the materials that we were creating. You can see some of the posters that we've created. Those are also translated into JPEG files so that they can be included in uh, school newsletters as well. We also created some public service announcements for use by our local media as well as on our district cable access channel. We provided in your written report there a, um, some stickers for principals to use in their buildings to award good behavior. And um, anything else that the, the principals needed in terms of materials, collateral materials, we uh, worked to provide that to them. Mid-Continent and KTTW cable channels provided free airtime for our video messaging. And then, as previously noted, in December 2016, the district was chosen as a Tradition of Caring Award winner by Kelloland TV, resulting in $17,000 worth of free airtime and web presence to further inform the community about the importance of school attendance and that this just isn't a school attendance issue but a workforce development issue as well. I was informed over the weekend that the Sioux Falls School District produced television spots began airing for the Tradition of Kello uh, Award. And so they will be aired during critical times of school attendance uh, when our attendance historically takes a dip. I can tell you that February is an awesome time to have um, public service announcements air because this is a ratings period for television, which means they're pulling out all the stops, trying to get as many people to watch as they possibly can, which means the potential viewership also goes up. So we very much appreciate um, their salesperson, Jack Gregg, for working with us, uh, Jamie Nold for kind of hooking us up and encouraging us to apply for that award, and we're grateful for it. So um, attendance is an issue that uh, needs to be on the minds of everyone, not just school personnel and parents, but our community as well in regards to workforce development. So with that, I am sending it, I believe, to Tracy for tiers of interventions for schools. The study committee reviewed um, research effective strategies and we also surveyed um, Sioux Falls School District principals to find out 
um, what is currently happening within their schools that they find effective, what are additional things that they might may um, need more resources on. And from that, we developed this multi-tiered approach because again, we know that not um, no students are alike and we are going to have to approach different um, students in a, in a different race. And so that's where this comes up with. Now, many of our schools in our district are currently doing these and providing these practice, practices and interventions. Um, however, creating this tier and kind of um, a visual aid for schools, um, we hope to make it more consistent and also it may be something that brings to mind that, hey, we haven't thought about this or we haven't quite looked at this. So, and I know it's not easily read up here, but if um, I believe you guys all have them in your board packet. So if you look at our procedures in the baseline and starting at the base of the pyramid, we thought it was um, a good thing to just have a general statement and a positive statement of um, what we're committed to as a district. And we want to be committed to providing that positive culture and climate within a school um, to ensure that all students are welcome in, um, in hopes of engaging kids. The procedure section is what we do on a daily basis, just procedures, our five and eight day attendance letters, um, anything that we don't necessarily see as being an intervening pr process, but it's more of this is how we notify parents, um, this is what we do, um, you know, the district-wide attendance campaign. Um, do we know that that is necessarily intervening with any individual student? We don't know that, but it's something that we do on the procedure level. Um, the attendance response team, again, going out and checking on students, knocking on doors. Is it something that's intervening at that moment? It may not be intervening, but it's, it's a procedure that we do have. That's something that's afforded to and offered up to all students. When we start moving up the tier process, it's when those procedures aren't necessarily working for all students. So when we move up to tier one, we're looking at, um, I'll use for an example, um, a referral to a nurse. So we have a parent that maybe calls in because um, a student is suffering from asthma, but it may be repeated call-ins. So maybe the nurse would call to say, how can we collaborate with you as a parent and what types of services can we offer at the school to um, have your student attend more frequently. And we know there's those um, long-term medical illnesses and that's not our targeted population here. We're just looking at what services can we provide to parents and offer them to um, encourage and assist students in attending school every day. So that might be a tier one. Well, maybe that attend or that absence continues and so the parent continues to call in saying, you know, my child's suffering from asthma then maybe it goes up to a tier two level. So the nurse is making contact with the parents to say, hey, can we get a release from the doctor? And we can collaborate with the doctor too to help support your child. And maybe what type of services or interventions or accommodations can we make at within the school to help support that attendance? And again, it just continues to increase. So when we look at procedures, that's offered to all students, and then we get more individualized because we do know that um, um, there are different barriers to student attendance and we wanna make sure that we're getting to know the families and that we're addressing those indivi individualized needs. So in, in, again, we know that um, this is never static and it's continually moving. Um, I can tell you that this is not the first pyramid that came about. We have worked on it time and time again, and we continue to work on it. And as we continue to research and look at things that other districts are doing or um, other evidence-based practices out there, we will continue to add to that. So it probably won't be the last pyramid you see, and it definitely is not the first pyramid I have saw. So it will definitely continue um, with that. Um, you know, with the resource list and as we move up, we get to tier four and tier five, and that's where you're moving into a more restrictive type scenario. And again, those tiers are, none of this is meant to be punitive in any nature. It's all meant, meant to be intervening in nature. So we wanna make sure that, you know, we're exhausting all of our resources as, as a school district. We're getting um, families connected with community resources um, to, to assist in any barriers that they may um, have to their students or kids attending school. Um, and that's what it's all about is that intervention process. Good evening. 
Um, in our work, uh, the, our group recognized and embraced that helping schools, families, and students overcome the barriers for getting students to school is not a matter for schools in isolation. It requires a community including schools, public officials, public agencies, businesses, families, and youth working together toward the goal to increase student attendance. Septem since September of 2016, the Sioux Falls School District has initiated dialogue with several community partners. And tonight I'll tell you about our dialogue with the community health partners. In December of 2016, select Sioux Falls School District administrators met with Avera McGreevy and Sanford Health Clinic administrators to discuss de medical documentation and attendance regarding <clears throat> uh, student absences, which are health related. The Sioux Falls School District recognizes the importance of accommodating students with special health needs, as well as the importance of students staying home when they are ill or, and or contagious. Healthcare providers play an important role in determining a student's health status and when they can, and when they can return to school. Medical documentation is often, often the means of communication between the healthcare provider and the school. During our conversation, both healthcare systems um, voiced a desire to learn about the health services that we're able to provide to students. They also requested a return to school letter uh, template outlining the information needed to document student health related absences. Um, we had a wonderful conversation and it was so great to have great community partners that were open to discussing these, these issues. So as a result of that meeting in January of 2017, we developed a health services brochure outlining the services that we provide and also a return to school letter template that were developed and provided to both healthcare systems. Both entities have pledged to provide the information and letter template to their healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. And we are hopeful that these interventions and ongoing communication will positively impact student attendance. Another critical dialogue that we had was with our mental health supports that we have here in the Sioux Falls School District. And Southeastern Behavioral Health provides home and school-based services and has assigned counselors in each of our schools across the city. This partnership allows Southeastern Behavioral Health to work with the families on identifying those problem areas that cause students to not be able to attend school regularly. Um, in addition, the counselors work with the staff members of our Sioux Falls School District to develop programming and that important communication between home and school on what those barriers might be and how we can do our programming in each individual school to help that child return to school. Um, through that communication, Southeastern Behavioral Health has several things that they can do to help us out with different kinds of evidence-based um, counseling theories that they use. In addition to that, Lutheran Social Services also can provide those things and has also reached out to us and also um, assists in those areas. Two of those evidence-based programs that we have that have been utilized in different areas with attendance is functional family therapy as well as dialectical behavior therapy. Um, both of those also work with families and students to kind of make that a uh, system change because we find that to be so important, not just with the families, but also with our work with them as well. Both of these services are research-based, as we talked about, um, and then several local mental health providers have also partnered with us and are willing to partner with us with regular school attendance. One case in point, there's a school that's also piloting a program, that's Washington High School, and they're implementing a pilot program with the help of Southeastern Behavioral Health called Graduate on Time, short as got, and they utilize Southeastern counselors to assist those students and families with eliminating barriers and addressing those issues that prevent those students from graduating on time. So the students selected for that program are juniors in high school that are behind their cohort either in credits or in completing coursework in time to graduate. They have different challenges that the Southeastern Behavioral Counselors work with to identify and again to address in effort to increase their attendance, credit attainment, and their overall well-being. Currently, there are 20 students being served in the program with the goal of 40 students by graduation of the 2018 school year. And again, all of the challenges that our families can shape I can um, face might be situational, might be temporary, one moment in time, they might be long-standing. And so our partnership with all of our mental health um, programs here in Sioux Falls is essential. I hope I'm not expected to be the entertainment portion of the 
program. <laughs> we'll leave that for Deb. Uh, in 2015, uh, Senate Bill 73 was passed into law. Senate Bill 73 is also known as the Juvenile Justice Reinvestment Initiative. And that initiative changed the truancy process throughout the state of South Dakota for, for the schools. Uh, there was also, in addition to that, many of the resources that you've just heard, the community-based resources or intervention programs that were also provided through that Senate Bill 73 and the Juvenile Justice uh, Reinvestment Initiative. In the process of changing the truancy, uh, we did work then with our local law enforcement, specifically our SROs, our local state's attorney, uh, and the courts, as well as many others within the Sioux Falls School District and across the state, in meeting also with area superintendents and others and we developed a truancy-based intervention program for the Sioux Falls School District, a process that went into implementation January 23rd that correlates directly to the changes in the law, which is now a citable offense for truancy, and the citable offenses are meant to be deterrence to the truancy process or absenteeism. So I'll go through quickly that, uh, or quickly as I can, the truancy-based intervention process, and you should have that document attachment as well. The first step in that is obviously that we work closely with our local agencies uh, to produce this document and that we continue to look at all the other resources that we have to help intervene on absenteeism for any of our students we have in the Sioux Falls School District. The first step in the truancy process or the truancy based interventions is that we will do our part as a Sioux Falls School District to continually be in contact and communication with our parents and our students as we go through and see absenteeism being a part of their uh, impact on the academics. The first step that we do is at that five to eight days, at both five and eight days, we do send out letters, attendance letters, to those parents and to the students. And then we also try to make contact. So someone from each of the individual schools will attempt to make contact with, make multiple attempts, and then log that in our infant and campus logging, uh, where we have that on the network for the student, or for our staff to be able to log that in. So at five to eight days, we make those contacts. Then, if the attendance is improved, that's great. That's the result we wanted. If not, we will look at that. Uh, and at that 10-day mark, look to see if the absenteeism has continued. We will also try to make contact with the parents to see if we can work with them as far as medical reasons that may come into play. Uh, that was mentioned as well uh, by Ms. Satter as far as working with our agencies in fulfilling that medical need. So we'll try to carry out plans uh, at the school level, 504s if needed, uh, work with the school nurses and the medical professionals to set up that type of a plan. If not, we'll require uh, medical documentation from the individuals if there's going to be ongoing absences after that 10-day mark. Uh, anytime there's medical documentation, that would not come into play. Obviously, medical documentation will overrule that and we want to work with the families with those medical needs. Once we get past that 10 days and we have made notification for those individuals that are still not coming to school on a regular basis, we look at day number 12 for qualifying absences. And when I say qualifying absences, there's a list on the bottom of that page. It goes into any of the things that may be medical, uh, that may be uh, death in the family, documented medical appointments, court, hazardous weather. There's a lot of different things that can go into that. If the school has made a plan and excused the individual student, that'll go into it as well. So when I talk about the 12 days uh, of absence, any of those days that would be included in there that aren't counted would not be counted in towards those 12 days. At that point in time, we'll again make contact with the family and send out a letter, a notification, uh, and then a first citation may be issued then by the school resource officer. That citation does require the individual to be in court uh, with a judge and be able to discuss uh, the absenteeism, the judge then has a, a choice then of any type of a fine up to $100 or dismissing it at that time if they choose to. But the goal is, and the, the goal of, of Senate Bill 73 was to use that as a deterrent. Um, and as we've heard back from some of the schools just in the short time that this has been in effect now, it has been a very positive deterrent uh, for many of the individual students as, as some of those schools are sending back emails and responses. So day 12 is that day that we would look at that first citation if it qualifies with the number of absences. After that, when we look into that 15th day, uh, there could be a student that may be dropped by uh, state rule if they've missed 15 consecutive days without notification to the school. 
We will try to continually, with our school resource officers, with our truancy officers, with the principals, administration, and counselors, continue to try to contact those individual students to make sure we can try to get them enrolled back in school. And obviously, any point in time they would contact us, we would get them enrolled back in school. We will still, even at that 15-day mark with the state rule, uh, still continually actively pursue those students to be in school and complete their schooling. Step number three, which goes into day number 17 of the absences, the qualifying absences, is where we'd look to have, again, a letter sent and continual contact with the families. And then we'd look for that second citation to be issued by the school resource officer if those days meet the qualifications on day number 17. And again, that citation require a court date with the individual uh, student and parent. And the judge would work and interact with them on their absenteeism to see if we can get that corrected and fixed. All along in any of these steps, we will continue to try to use our community-based resources, our schools, our counselors, and any other resources we have in those interventions uh, to intervene on any of the absenteeisms that we are seeing with the individual students. When we get to day number 22, and that'd be step four, the day 22 would go back to what we would similarly or, or used to recall as a truancy process, where if it was defined as truancy and there's a habitual absenteeism, uh, without any of those defined excused reasons, uh, that's where the individual judge could place the truant juvenile on probation. And there's outlines for that, but that would end up being on day number 22 or after. Each of these steps that we have had are meant to hold the schools accountable and us accountable as a district that we are gonna continually contact parents. We are gonna continually work with the parents. We're gonna use our pyramid of interventions and use the resources in our community to help to intervene well before it gets to that 22nd day in probation may be uh, administered through the court system. So that is the truancy-based intervention process. As I said, uh, this does not <coughs> meet the needs of the majority of the students, but it will help to intervene with some students. And we've heard back from some of the schools already with some of those students that they're working on, that citation process help, has helped to reduce some of the absenteeism. So that's the truancy-based interventions. So as a committee, um, our work was to get going, which all of these people have described well, but also to talk about how will we as a district keep attendance at the forefront of all of us as staff, as parents, as students, as a community. <clears throat> so from that, we developed an ongoing process for the district. Um, we, um, just as many of you know, we have a curriculum council. We would have a district level attendance council. That group would meet quarterly during the year um, with the, the primary goal to keep attendance at the forefront of the Sioux Falls School District and community. We would ensure current partnership dialogues <coughs> continue. We would network to expand those partnerships in our community explore other research interventions to keep adding to the tiers, to respond to our students and the barriers they face, to find further information from other districts who are finding success on the attendance forefront, and at the district level to continue to monitor what trends and changes we see in our data. As, as Tracy said, it's not a one-time deal. It needs to be alive and always working. So that was the goal of our process. At the same time, at each building, there would be a building attendance team, as there is today. Today, building attendance teams are responding to individual students and their barriers. The tiers of intervention should help them with other ideas us enlisting more supports in our community should support our schools um, in this journey. But we'll also charge our building attendance team to lead their building in, attend in developing attendance initiatives. And that attendance isn't always reactive. How can we set ourselves up for the message and for students and parents at their school? Principals have been involved in the study committee some of them are doing awesome things in their building and seeing changes. So how can we take that energy, spread it to everywhere, and keep the, the constant message of students who are in school 
will receive more academic success and school completion if they come. So with that, I'll close the multidimensional phases of developing an action plan, and the team will stand by for any questions that you have. Thank you. That's a lot of work. We know how important attendance is, so thank you for that. Any questions from anybody? Hearing none, I need a motion to acknowledge the multidimensional phases toward developing an action plan to increase student attendance. So moved. Second. Sorry. Any further discussion? No, a lot of great teamwork. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, awesome. I like the, the proactiveness of it, um, a lot of the initiatives that you guys have put into place. So looking to see how, how well those turn out. Great. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right. The second report for tonight is the legislative update, and I'll turn that over to Mr. Veek. Thank you, Dr. Maher. Not to be outdone, uh, Kate <laughs> or Tel Noah, and I decided to team up on this report as well. Um, we have had a three week break since our last regular board meeting. So there's been a lot of action on a lot of bills. Um, we, there's been 22 bills in the house that we've tracked. Four of those are considered key. There's been 24 in the Senate and four of those are key. So with uh, Mr. President, with your permission, I'll just focus on the key bills, skipping Please. over a couple of them and Kate will take those at the end. Thank you. Thanks. So if you turn to page five, that's the first one. said than done. House Bill 1123, it was an act to revise certain provisions regarding the participation of homeschool students in certain interscholastic activities. Uh, we considered a key bill, we opposed it. Our rationale was that the district would not be able to require that homeschool students maintain a passing grade in the course they enroll in um, by mandating that homeschool students can be required to enroll in no more than one course and removing the one-year exclusion. When a student family chooses to homeschool, the bill sets up a loophole that would allow students who are failing courses to declare their homeschooling and continue to participate in interscholastic activities. That bill was deferred to the 41st day in the House Committee. Um, you'll find, you'll see later on that another bill is in that's very similar to this. So, so we'll talk about that when we get to it. If we go to, uh, the next page, page six, House Bill 1125 was an act to make accessible to the public certain information relating to the Partners in Education Tax Credit Program. If you remember back to that uh, work session we did when we went through the ASBSD proposals, that this was very similar to what they had proposed. It would have required most information related to the private school tuition program established by the 2016 legislature to be submitted to the state and this information would then become a public record. Personally, personally identifiable information regarding scholarship recipients, recipients would remain private. We supported the bill because public education, because virtually, virtual public money was going to support the program and we thought it should be public records like school data or most of that is public records. That bill was killed in committee um, seemed like most of the testimony was about not identifying the the companies um, that were that were submitting the info, but there was a lot of other information that would have been interesting as well. But the testimony was centered on that. So we're going to skip House Bill 1170, and Kate will take that later, and we'll go to page nine. On page nine, you'll find House Bill 1196. It would lower the compulsory age attendance for school districts uh, back from age 18, which it currently is back to 16, which uh, was changed several years ago. We consider that, again, we're recommending it to be a key bill, and we're saying oppose it. The rationale is if schools are held accountable for high school students once they start, then they need to stay in school. If students are allowed to drop out, then the accountability rules need to change that do not hold the school accountable for that student in the cohort. If this bill were to become law, it would make it near impossible for schools to hold those at-risk students to graduation. 
um, students would be able to walk away at age 16. So um, that bill is currently sitting in house education and hasn't been acted on yet. Um, if we move ahead to page 12, Next key bill is Senate Bill 85. It, um, the bill, the proposed bill provides a procedure for parents to remove their children from mandatory state testing. We'd recommend opposing the bill in order for accountability measures to accurately reflect the quality of education a public school provides. It is essential that all students complete the tests. In addition, assessments results are used to guide instruction and curriculum decisions to maximize student learning. Allowing some students to opt out of testing will definitely skew the results. The next key bill is on page 14. That's, uh, oh, by the way, that bill hasn't been acted on yet either. Um, Senate Bill 96 is on page 14. It has been killed. We oppose it. It was a bill that would require employers to grant sick leave benefits to employees who work continuously for 90 days. We have collected bargaining agreements with eight groups and uh, riders, and we provide sick leave benefits for employees. The bill does not include substitute staff, part-time temporary staff, work study or student workers. As a result, the school district would have to use additional resources for timekeeping expenditures. So. We just recommend opposing that bill, but it's already been killed. Next, um, we're gonna skip Senate Bill 134. Kate's gonna take that one as well at the end. We're gonna go to page 19. I think this is the last bill I'm gonna go over. It's, that's Senate Bill 177, kind of, uh, it was introduced uh, by the Committee of State Affairs, I guess when that other bill was dying. It was past the, the time for individuals to submit bills. So this is very similar to the bill we talked about, that House Bill 1123. Um, a little bit different rationale on this. It, it, the courts have consistently upheld that activities are a privilege, not a right. There should be an equitable application of the rules that govern how students earn the privilege of participating in interscholastic activities. Besides enrollment, those rules cover things such as age, academic achievement, attendance, behavior, and transfer between districts. For instance, public schools establish grading criteria and attendance requirements that homeschool students are not held accountable to. This bill results in two sets of rules governing participation in interscholastic activities. This bill is actually even a little looser than the, the House bill. The House bill said school, school boards could re require students to participate in at least one, or to be enrolled in at least one course, this bill basically says none of that, and it doesn't even have that requirement. So once again, we consider it key and uh, are opposing. It is still in Senate Ed waiting for action. And with that, I'd turn it over to Kate Martel Nowak. If you go back to page 16 first with Senate Bill 134, um, this bill has yet to be acted on, however, still um, suggesting that it's a key bill because of the implication on, on school districts. Um, essentially, it would prohibit the use of public school resources, including personnel time supplies, communication systems, or facilities to affect the outcome of any political vote. It imposes a $250 civil penalty, penalty for a personal violation and allows a fine to be levied against a district for each violation as well. And it also allows a taxpayer to bring in action to recover the misuse of funds. Uh, the district would oppose this bill. As you know, there is already a state law that prohibits public entities from expending public funds for the purpose of influencing <coughs> elections. That law um, applies to um, elections and uh, ballot initiatives and it also allows an exception um, for school districts to present factual information for the or any public entity to present factual information for the purpose of educating voters on a ballot question this 
proposed law seems to both eliminate that exception for school districts and our employees. Um, it's unclear as why school districts and our employees are singled out. And then also um, the language in this bill specifically says political vote, which is different than the language used in 122720, which is um, refers to the election of a candidate or ballot initiatives. So not finding a definition of political vote, I could only assume that that would mean a vote in the legislature, um, any other kind of political vote. And so that would make us creating even this document, um, lobbying um, at the state level um, against this law, which would um, result in both civil pen penalty for a personal violation and for the district. So that's why we would oppose this law. And then if you go back to page eight, House Bill 1170, I, after putting this together today, I checked again this afternoon and it looks like um, the Judiciary Committee and the Senate um, approved an amendment. Um, so I'll talk about that when we get there as, as well. But uh, as you all well know, last year, um, the legislature passed chapter 323, which is now a law that um, governs public entities and including school boards relating to conflicts of interest regarding contracts. And um, when we reviewed that law last summer, I think a good word to describe it would be confusing and unmanageable for um, a school district. And I assume other public entities had the same problem because now um, they're proposing amendments to that law. Um, the, the bill itself is 13 pages and it's confusing to get through. So what I attempted to do is um, show you how the changes of the proposed 1170 would affect what we put together in our policy AH last summer as a way to maybe ease, as an easier way to digest um, the current proposed changes. Um, to the law, and then I also uh, suggested some comments on how I think that we would want to move forward with an amendments. Um, and essentially, I think that we would want to further amend uh, 1170 to limit the application of the law to only include board members and executive administrators, to limit the related persons included in the disclosure requirements and um, to clarify when a person is required to make a disclosure based on his or her employment with a party to the, a contract or a related person's employment. And then also to eliminate the requirement to report disclosures to the auditor general and attorney general as those as anything that happens here is already public record. Um, and then there's just, I think, a typo that needs to be clarified. So, but I also wanted to provide you an opportunity to review how the 1170 would affect our policy and um, weigh in on my proposed amendments, but also to suggest any of your own. I think your proposed amendments are fine. Um, you mentioned that the original or the law talks about other public entities that are not school boards. What other, well, I'll make it simple. If other public entities don't include the legislature and other elected officials in the state, I think we should oppose it. I don't see any reason that school boards and uh, uh, councils for uh, 
counties, for cities, for townships should be subject to this kind of disclosure if the if the legislators themselves don't have to comply with the same with the same sort of a standard i'm not opposed to the standard but i think it should apply to every elected and appointed official in the state of south dakota if it doesn't do that then i'm opposed to it flat out fair is fair right is right and this doesn't pass my fairness test but that's my opinion that the rest of the board can certainly weigh in on that. I, my position is that we oppose it. But we're opposing a cleanup. I mean, this is a cleanup of the original legislation that we all understand to be flawed. Very flawed. The whole law should be thrown out and we should start over with, a, with an ethics law that applies to every elected official in the state. That and is my position. Shield. Say that again. Can we get, can we repeal this? Well, we could have a proposed amendment striking the whole chapter. That'd be fine. Any comments on that? While I agree, I would also like to fix the current law. So by offering our suggestions, we could at least fix what it is currently. Well, one of the fixes would be that it applies to the legislature, mm -hmm. to the governor, and everybody up and down the line. Yeah. Uh, we shouldn't be singled out. To clarify, so the first half of the chapter applies to state entities. Um, I do not believe it applies to the legislature itself. Well, and I'm then surprised. the the <laughs> second. <laughs> The second half of the chapter applies to um, school districts and other education entities. Any other comments, Carly? What you feel? Well, I, I would agree. It should, we shouldn't be singled out as the you know as elected right. officials that have to comply to this. It should apply across the board. Concepts are should apply to everybody. I agree. So oppose or repeal? Well, I think if we, yeah. Oppose it. I'm opposed unless it applies to okay. everyone across the board. Fair is fair, right is right. Yeah. No gray areas in that. Yeah, I, I think we need to oppose that with your suggestion. Based on what I hear your comments, instead of opposing i think um we would still want to amend but amend by right. striking the whole the existing law yep i'm good with that mm -hmm. yeah works no i just that's what that's what that's what we understand and that's what we'll okay. lobby against is basically basically we will amend to repeal what is already in codified law yes Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> okay. That's the end of my report. We need a motion. Sure. And a we do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think overall legislation. Yeah. Ended. So move. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And that carries. Kate? Yes, just pulling up the documents now. So the policies that we are reviewing tonight, we have uh, six that are up for review, revised. Um, these were reviewed in committee and, um, and by the administration and given the minimal revisions to the policies, second readings aren't necessary. So I'll go through them. Um, by title. So we have IHAL, religion in the schools and at school activities. There were no changes. IMB and its accompanying regulation, teaching about controversial sensitive issues. There were no changes. IMD, school observances and ceremonies. There were no changes. 
JJAB and its accompanying regulation, limited open forum in middle and high schools. This just clarified roles of non-school persons. Um, JJID and its accompanying regulation, student physicals for school athletics, there were no changes. And LB, relations with other schools and school systems, there were no, um, no changes. So just so that everyone else in the room is aware, we regularly review policies. So these were just happened to be, the ones that had no changes were um, part of their um, sort of regularly scheduled business um, for us to review those. So, so I move to approve the review revision of the said policies and accompanying regulations. Second. Hmm? Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Um, and then the next one we have, or last one we have, is um, ICA, it's a school calendar policy. Um, we reviewed this policy because as probably most of the audience knows and our community knows, we've been in the process of um, reviewing our calendar for 17-18 school year. Um, and so we made some changes to the... 19, sorry. Right, 18-19, thank you. Um, so we made some changes to the policy simply to allow us to even consider any changes to the, the calendar. So um, you'll see that we did strike out um, the language that says any calendar presented to the board must have a school start date on or after the first Tuesday following Labor Day. This is not saying that we are starting before Labor Day or after Labor Day. It just enables us to, um, once the calendar committee makes their recommendations, to um, approve the calendar however which way it may be. So um, this just, because this policy needs to have a review revise, um, or sorry, a first reading, we need time to be able to approve it. So um, with that, I move to approve the first reading of policy ICA. Second. Any further discussion? Just like to add a second reading will be up on March 13th. Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. I'd like to thank the scouts for coming tonight. I believe we're working on some merit badges, is that correct? All right, I'm sure. Uh, it was riveting, should, wasn't it? I was, <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say that and didn't wanna. <laughs> we get to do this every two weeks. You only have to do it once. <laughs> I didn't see Take anybody fall your... asleep either, so that was good. Good well, job that and was congratulations. you were asleep. Yeah, I, I stayed awake. <laughs> so thank you for being here tonight, guys. Thank you. We have a motion to adjourn. So move. Meeting adjourned. Well, just a couple things. I saw you here.